On this episode of the Built by Anime podcast, I get the honor of speaking with one of the legends in the YouTube game, Mari Takahashi. And with such an illustrious career here on YouTube spanning over a decade, we dive into how she started on Smosh Games. I saw a post for somebody needing somebody who spoke Japanese, and it turns out that was for Smosh. Yes. Hey guys, you're watching another episode of Super Mario Fun. And while her career started in the early days of YouTube, that means there was a life before the creator. So we get to travel all the way back in time to see where she gets this ridiculous work ethic from. Like school was like a thing mm. that, that was like a, an escape from right. the from the real life, which was, I was working at three years old. Was, even the worst days as a content creator is better than your best days at your worst job. You know what I mean? Turning around and, and saying, thanks for World War II. And I was like, I was like, me? Yeah, I'm like, I'm responsible. And for those that want to know what Mari's been up to since the Smosh Games era, we get to dive into what she's doing currently in the film industry. It definitely mm. feels scary sometimes. I don't know. The the only way that I can think of it is is like going super sad and be like, ah. if you don't believe in yourself, there's no amount of support that can that can really get you out of things. And last but not least, we got to talk about her top five anime of all time. That was my thirsty phase because I was like, oh, anime characters are hot. So it was like Trunks. <laughs> It was Trunks and Kenshin all the all the way for me. I was like, I was like, all right, cool. So builders, without further ado, the Built by Anime Podcast, Chapter Five, Mari Takahashi. It's like, it's actually really dope to have you on. Oh, I'm uh, excited. You know, I love having deep combos with you. Yeah. <laughs> it always I mean, seems to go there with us. <laughs> I, it, for real, it actually does, and I and uh, I think to you being a vet in in this space, which is so crazy to say, because like in hindsight, the space is it's still in its infancy. Oh, it's a baby. I feel. Yeah, you totally. know what I mean. Like as a medium, it's like, but you're a veteran in it. Because um, it changed so fast. I, yeah. <laughs> It's so wild. So it's like in my head, it's it's one of those things for me too, where you've been able to adapt and grow and change even through all of the changes in it. Um, but I, like before the YouTube stuff, let's go all the way back. I think like like how does what what was like your early upbringing? Like where where did Mari start? Not YouTube, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, my early upbringing was literally 24 seven, 365 ballet. Like school was like a thing mm. that, that was like a, an escape from right. the, from the real life, which was, I was working at three years old. I was on tour. I was on contract. Like I was already in a working mindset at three. And so school was like my little like wow. thing where like, I'm like, Oh, I get to escape. This is wonderful and nice. <laughs> Wow. So, you know, ballet was always uh, on the horizon as kind of like my destiny. My mom is a ballet mm. teacher and a ballet dancer. And so, I mean, I, I was, you know, dan dancing in the womb or, you know, dancing it straight out of the womb or whatever you call mm. it. Um, so it was always going to be a part of my life. I, I didn't necessarily choose it. Um, mm. It was just the life that I knew from a very, very early age. Tell me about how that feels like going, like being super string, like stringent, like obviously I'm not a ballerina. My partner, she's Bree, she's been a studio kid since forever, but I don't really understand what that level of discipline does at a young age. Like, did you feel different from kids at school in certain aspects or did you... Did you not even look at it like that? I it, I wasn't in the mindset of comparing yet at school. I think it was mm. kind of like it almost felt like living a double life for for a lot of it because I would go to the studio after I would um, go to school and then I would be there until 10 p.m. And then mm. I would do my homework if I had homework afterwards. And then, you know, over and over Saturdays, I would go to uh 
to Japanese school and then I would go to ballet afterwards until 6 p.m. Like it was just a, a I didn't have anything else to compare it to other than mm. knowing that I didn't have time to hang out with a lot of my friends a lot of the time. I'd be, the, yeah. the, it would always be like, sorry, I have ballet. Um, but I know that the thing that did stick with me from a very early age before I could comprehend mm. it was I had responsibilities. Um, mm. When you're on contract, when you're at that age, you are still responsible for showing up to rehearsals on time, uh, getting the choreography correct, not ha uh, not having like your shoes untied on stage, making sure that your costumes are on correctly, because if you don't, you get fined. So I remember I'm like, oh, oh wow. I don't want to get a $5 fine for that. I don't want to. And everything, there was a list of what you could get fined for. And so I wow. knew that there was this exchange of like, you're giving me money. And with that money, I go eat lunch and I, and I, um, and treat my mom to lunch when we're on tour. And if mm. I don't do this correctly, then that money doesn't come. So like mm. I had that exchange understanding when I was a kid and I just felt like the heaviness of needing to show up and do my part. Mm. Was that ever felt, did it ever feel like pressure or is it just more of like, this is just what it is. Like you doesn't really, didn't really feel like that. I think it was pressure. I remember there was one time, but you know, I mean, it set me up for a life of like, I just know I'll get through anything. Um, yeah. And I remember, uh, I was maybe seven or eight. And um, in the Nutcracker, we were the, the my part was the bonbons, and all these little kids, including myself, we have to hold on to this really uh, uh, heavy wooden box, and we're all inside this box, and we all mm. have little like things on either side to hold, and so there's maybe like eight or nine of us inside this little box, and we're holding onto this wooden box, and we walk mm. out, and the lid opens. And all of us pop out and we're like the little bonbons that pop <laughs> out of a box. But yeah. I remember one time the the lid, this heavy wooden lid, slammed on my head. And um, I remember being in a lot of pain and crying. And yet I finished the whole thing. And my mom, who was on the side of the stage, watched this all unfold where I'm crying profusely while also still nailing the choreography. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think in my kid brain I was really understanding what was happening. I was just right. separating two two things happening, which was right. I'm in pain. I want to be a kid. I want to cry, and I want somebody yep. to care. And the other side, yep. being, I got a job to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's wild. crazy. Yeah. That training is nuts. I mean, because Bree would tell me, like, um, she was like, yeah, when she was in, I think I want to say it was ballet class, but. I could be wrong, but she was saying she had done something. I think her shoulder got dislocated. She's in the class and they just pop it back. They brace it up and she's going, continuing with, just with whatever going. across the floor stuff that she has to do. And I was it's just wild. like, wow. And she was like, yeah, like, it's just like, all right, cool. Yep. You're good. Keep it going. Um, was it like yeah. that? Like, it's just kind of like, yeah, you just got to keep rolling with it. Straight up. I mean, it's like you call it warrior mentality Sorry, or I whatever it is, but it's hmm. like it, it it is like that. I mean, I the show must go on is a it, it's like a it's a saying that I think that overarcs my entire life where it's just like I just whatever it is, I know I'll get through it. And if I mm. have to, I'll get through it with a serene face and I'll be dying and crying inside, <laughs> but you will not know it. You know, and it's like, there's good and right. bad. The masking right. is a thing where in my adulthood, I have had to unmask and be like, no, things are not great. And right. Allow myself to admit that because with too much masking, then you become this hardened sort of uh, person that is, I don't know, resentful or, you know, just doesn't have enough grace for yourself, for the people around you. And so I feel like I've had to kind of like figure out what that balance is, because when you when you grow up in a in a place where it is very much like that, where it's like, OK, yeah, you're hurt. Is it good now? Great. Get back out there. And it very much right. is. You know, it's like, because I'm not at the center of attention of this thing. There's 
you know, an audience who paid for a ticket that is expecting yeah. a show. And so, you know, broken toes, whatever it is, I've done it. Like I've gone out there, mm. I've gotten, um, yeah, you know, like, uh, what do you call it? Um, steroid shots to get through the pain, get back out there immediately. Wow. I've, I've had a 103 fever and I'm like, can I please, please just not do this? And my mom said, it gets to 104, we'll go to the hospital. And it never hit 104, and all I wanted was my fever to just hit 104. Yeah. <laughs> because that at that point, it's like, it's bad. It's like right. 104, and you stay at 104, it could be fatal. And I'm like, I just yeah. wanted to hit 104. But it was 103, <laughs> and I went out there, and I still did wow. the sugar plum. Yeah. So I don't know. It's There's good and bad. There's good and bad. There. There's good and bad. And I think this is, we'll probably touch on this a little later, but I think, do you think that had, a, that yeah. has a lot to do with like your, with your work ethic? Like, do you think that translated like as you were growing up, like just kind of like, I just got to go. Cause it seems like you never fucking stop. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, um, you know, content creation is a very normal thing for one for people to want to get into these days. And it, it is absolutely normalized uh, in the sense of like when kids are asked what they want to be it used to be like, I want to be a firefighter or I want to be an astronaut. Right. And now it's like, I want to be a YouTuber, you know, and <laughs> when that was first hap starting to happen, it was freaking me out. But now it's like it is just so normal to hear that. Mm. Um what I always say is like, have a job before you get mm. into this because you have to have a baseline to compare it to. And for me, yeah. I think that work ethic is the baseline was so high of what I would expect a work day to be like and how much sort of like physical and emotional agony I would be in in order to get through the work day that anything mm. that I'm doing in content creation feels like it feels like a like a day off like i get to create in my own domain without someone hovering over me saying that it's constantly right. not good enough unless it's in my own head which sometimes right. it does happen i have the demons in here suck um yeah but i have to always remind myself that those demons are kind of like a reflection of mm. what i heard for a lot of my life in that professional like realm and so yeah i i i think that having a baseline to compare it to no matter what your job was obviously not ballerina but like if you've worked in retail if you've worked in in uh food services or whatever it is all of that will translate into what you are going to do as a content creator and i swear mm. to you even the worst days as a content creator is better than your best days at your worst job you know what i mean i hope that makes sense yeah no no i completely agree and i, I so in in the in the dance world going you know obviously you had a very early career um how long did you stay in that until it was like i'm i'm out like yeah when was when was that time uh, let's see. So I, I, I went professional at 17 and it was like mm -hmm. my full-time career. Um, I started my first YouTube, I, I put my first YouTube video up at 25 and mm. I didn't retire from dancing until I was 20, uh, 29 so it was a full four years oh, wow. of me holding on to this career being like yeah there's no way i'm giving up on this very very straight track to retirement where i'm like i will right. dance until my hips break and then i will <laughs> teach ballet until i die like yeah very linear very like uh my, my whole life's roadmap was already right. mapped out for me right. and instead YouTube comes along is like, hey, you want no roadmap? You want no playbook? You want no direction? And it's up to you to make it? And so for four years, I was like, nah, nah, that sounds that sounds like it's a little bit not my up, my up not up my alley. I'm like, I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not like a, you know, make my own way sort of sort of person. I'm like, I'm a great 
company man i'm a good yes man you tell me to get on stage and do the choreography and i'll do it and youtube was like let's improvise and so <laughs> it was four years of me being like no nah, wow. i don't think it's for me until it was, that was big enough <laughs> right i mean so because you started out how did you start out on youtube oh well during the summer uh my company would have the summers off and so i didn't have uh, a contract and so during the summers i would take any job ever i was like a magician's assistant i would dress up in mm. tutu and go to like birthday parties um i would just take any gig ever and so right. i was scouring craigslist and the equivalency for craigslist for like entertainers which is called sf casting um mm. and i saw a Art, or I saw a post for somebody needing somebody who spoke Japanese uh, for a sketch comedy thing, paid 50 bucks in Sacramento. And I was like, fantastic, 50 bucks. Let's go. Yeah. And so I went to it and it turns out that was for Smosh. And so I met mm. the guys from Smosh and I was like, hey, what do you guys do? This is kind of cool. And they're like, oh, we yeah. make web videos. And I was like, ah, oh, neat. And so then I went home that night and looked them up and I was like, oh, these guys are like huge. They have like 10 million subscribers back in 2010. Right. I think Which they were is... like bonkers. Yeah, huge. That's huge. I think they were maybe number two or number three most subscribed on the uh, on YouTube. I think number one might have been Ryan Higa at that point. And I hadn't realized that the, the video that I was in where I need to speak Japanese, I, w which I went in for for like a one off ryan was also in it and i was a huge ryan higa fan right didn't know smosh but i knew ryan higa and i was like oh my gosh right. that's so cool but i didn't find that out until like after so that's how i started <laughs> it was so like, random okay so it like it was so you basically <laughs> got in, in introduced to the content world through a craigslist ad yeah yeah and and you that's... know it's like <laughs> It's the reason why my motto for working in this industry and all other industries, whatever it is, like show up and don't be an asshole. Like it, yeah. I feel like that has, that has been the most prevalent roadmap for anything that I've done in my life, which is like, show up and be professional, you know, like show mm. up for the people around you and for yourself. And mm -hmm. then, like, be nice because, uh, you know, we got along on set that that day that Ian and Anthony were like, hey, will you come back tomorrow for this recurring role? And they didn't know me. They didn't know my background or what I do. They, we just kind of got along that day. Um, and the recurring role turned out to be Smosh Pit Weekly. And I, I oh, wow. got that. And my YouTube career what just went and I just arrived, you know, they gave me my own show. I wrote it. I produced it from home. I directed it. I hope, you know, like I wrote the whole thing and edited the whole thing. Like right. I learned how to YouTube by just kind of slapping things together and putting it on their enormous channel. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think it just kind of speaks to they, they could tell that I was professional, even though I was not um even 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 though i had no uh like prior producing or anything online they knew that i was professional enough that i would that i would show up to work you know and i would get mm. the job done um and then i don't know when you're a pleasant enough person and i say enough because i don't know i'm assuming i'm pleasant enough to be around <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? i hope, I hope but... so I, I hope people like me <laughs> <laughs> but it's like you know it's it's a lot easier to um continue working with somebody that way and like as i get older and as as i continue to do productions i i realize that adam sandler's really got it right you know he, he like he's like constantly working with his friends like what a what yeah. an absolute um honor you know to be able to do that and, yeah. and, and and i see it in like ricky gervais too it's like in anything yeah. that you see him in, it's like oh it's the same people and it's like why why yeah. why does he keep using the same people and it's like yeah you want to work with people why that wouldn't you love you? Yes. yeah why wouldn't you yes it's like ultimate goals it's great yeah yeah it's so cool and i think that's something that uh i think youtube kind of almost sets you up for in a way because if you're if you're building something with other people 
you're strategically putting people around you that you want to work with. Uh, and then hopefully when you start collaborating with other people, like, oh, I like this person, you guys start doing more things together. So I think that's almost like a setup for something like that, or it's an, a more attainable uh, way of doing something like that. Yeah. Um, so like, okay, so you you fall into YouTube by accident and then yep. they're like, hey, take this show and, and do your thing. Like, was there so because we talked about the pressures early on when you were a kid, like, did that feel anywhere near that type of pressure or did it still kind of feel like, all right, like, how did it feel for you? You know, I'm glad that I was pretty naive to the whole situation because mm. Smosh Pit Weekly, which is a show which is just just my face on a channel that has been around for, at that point, five, six years, and the audience has only really known Ian and Anthony, and then all of a sudden my dumb face is front and center in these like shows every Saturday. I was so naive to what a million people watching every week actually meant. Like, it mm. is still today, like, like you know, a video getting a million hits these days, it, it'll just roll off like it's nothing for people. Right. But if you really think about it, that's a bananas number. Like, I don't yeah. know what a million people in front of me look like. Like, it's just yeah. not quantifiable. And so, yeah. you know, like... You know, like for us, like like an audience of like twelve hundred people, that makes sense, right? Like that that's a filled yeah. theater. Like I know right. what that sounds like. I know what that yep. feels like. I know what an what an energy of a room like that feels like. Yeah. I have no idea what a million yeah. people watching. <laughs> right. What that is, and so I think when these videos were going live every week, it wasn't really hitting me. It, it was just like this number that was like, whoa, that's like crazy and then mm. i would go fill a 250 seat theater and perform that weekend and to me right. what was attainable and understandable and like visceral was what it felt like to be in a theater and so it didn't freak me out that so many people were watching um i think it was like surprising but also not surprising that so many people were like vehemently hating it um mm. And I'm glad that I was pretty naive at that point, too, because it was like, so the reason why people were upset was because I was the first, like, woman to be on a, a, a channel with two boys, predominantly. Yeah. And so, you know, like, the sexist remarks were like, whose girlfriend is she? Is it Ian or Anthony's? And my response would always be, I'm both you know just to like <laughs> like mess with people and they're like ha ha yeah. okay i'm like and so that rolled off because i know that i got the job legitimately in the sense that like i'm like i was just a nobody and they just handed it to me um not yeah. that it wouldn't be legitimate if i if i was one of their girlfriends but like it, i think it didn't like puncture a, a layer that yeah. they thought was hurting me like the sexist comment so i didn't really see it as a sexist comment i saw it as like a like oh like you're me when i was upset that justin timberlake was dating britney spears as if i had a chance <laughs> and so i was like i get you i get you <laughs> and you're fine I'm like, yeah, I'm like yeah i'm like you have a chance i'm not I'm not in the running, so you you still have a chance. Don't be mad right. at me for that. Um, and and so then like the other ones were like, Mari just like she's just like trying really hard, and she wants the audience to love her so much. In which I would uh, comment back, yes, I am trying very very hard. I need you to know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you're not wrong. This is new for me, and I am giving it my full send effort. <laughs> and so I think people just got it that I was just like, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, none of this is penetrating what you think it is. It's not hurting my feelings because I've heard yeah. way, way worse in ballet. Like nothing is more hurtful than like the mm. shape of you 
is not right and yeah. they're like you're not funny and i'm like i'll take that any day i'm like you don't <laughs> like me for my wit my personality my brains that's fine at least you're not like the shape of your foot is just not anatomically right and so therefore i can't right. give you this job i'm like i can't break right. my feet <laughs> and try to get this job but i can <laughs> try to be funnier more wittier yeah. and smarter and all those other things i'm like i can fix that so that doesn't hurt yeah yeah it was an interesting that's adjustment. interesting i mean yeah i i did um door-to-door -door sales and before that i was a pretty emotional person in terms of like things affecting me like that in terms of like mm -hmm. people's opinions and stuff and you quickly find out how to deal with criticism or comments when it's being jarred at your face <laughs> uh, uh, when you're unexpectedly walking up on somebody's house you know what I mean oh, like no. uh, and and you get like the craziest to your face comments like oh. yeah like I've been yeah I've been called everything everything so That's for awful. me it never, when I was on YouTube for the first time, it never, it was just like, it would just roll off. Yeah. Like, yep. and it's like, like, dude, like that, now try again. Like, try, try, try yes. next time. Like, it's, it's what I it mean, felt like. And so it's like, have that job before you get into content creation, right? Like, yeah. I can't, I can't emphasize it enough where it's just mm. like, you will have a job at some point in your life where you will constantly remember it. And you're like, that is the hardest day I've worked in my life. No amount of like staying up to edit something for like 48 hours will yeah. ever equate to being a hard day compared to the stuff in the past, you know? And it's like, yeah. I think it's a superpower to be able to go through that stuff and then mm. see content creation as like, like oh this is this is great I I I'm staying up for myself, and the right. only person that's gonna tear it down worse is myself, <laughs> you know. And it's like yeah 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 having that having that uh, job beforehand, man that's funny. It was door to door salesman for you, huh? That's where you got your yeah, worst. For <sighs> I was I was selling CenturyLink internet in Las Vegas. Oh man! And so as soon as you walk on the porch, you're like, no sir. I don't want to even say hello. I don't even want to talk oh, to yeah. you. Or they'll open and have like the screen door there. Why are you in this neighborhood? Like, uh, <laughs> or you don't belong here. Where are you? <laughs> like, I, oh, I had the craziest. My I had the craziest. <laughs> oh, we don't talk to Muslims. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> just, just, just. I've heard, I've heard the craziest stuff. It does remind me of this. Um, moment I had about like carrot top, right? Like I, I, I made some quip. I was talking to Peter. Uh, that's my partner. Mm -hmm. That's my husband. Um, and I said something where, where I was like dogging on, on carrot top out of nowhere. And then I stopped myself and I was like, how come carrot top always gets dogged on? Like, where did that start from? And so then I started Googling where I'm like, where was the tipping point where like carrot top became like the the um butt of like people's jokes you know and so i went mm. down this whole like rabbit hole found all these interviews of him and there was one that was really fascinating he was he was talking about um addressing that because one of the the podcasts that he was on they were like yeah like how do you feel about people making fun of you you know you've had this like long illustrious career and yet you know people like don't respect you as a comedian but they're not really sure right. if you're like like a like a stage act or a comedian or whatnot and he said something so profound that it turned my my entire understanding of who carrot top is he said, none of the things that people say matter because you have to know the source. And mm. when he was a comedian starting up, George Carlin saw his act and George George Carlin said, hey, you know, I think you've got something special. I think you're you're good at what you do. And so mm. nothing nothing gets through him as as something that matters because the source matters george carlin yeah. at the top of his game gave him that insight and you know like joe nobody coming to see his show being like yeah you suck not george carlin
doesn't matter. <laughs> we'll probably never be an entertainer, a comedian, a stage person. We'll never have a residency at Las Vegas. So why does that comment matter? And so I, you know, mm -hmm. like, I think that it, it it took me down this whole like wonderful road of me starting out like dogging on them for no other reason than like everybody does question mark shrug into right. being like I respect this guy so much and I'm gonna take wow. that little nugget of information and I'm going to keep that near and dear to my heart because yeah hmm. yeah the, the 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 like the opinions of peers that I respect and, and people who make art the way that, that, that I respect, that matters. And mm. everything else is just like, oh, but you don't do what I do. So, right. you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in a similar boat. I think it's one of those things where uh, that's probably my biggest insight to people that want to go on to YouTube is – how do you feel about people's opinions of you that you don't mm. know? Like, how do you feel about that? Cause that will, that hurts people a lot when they're not used to seeing that on a daily basis. For sure. Um, so yeah, that's such a, that's again, a really cool way of breaking down a very nuanced idea but like the sort but what's the source and that's that's yeah. i love that that's actually awesome and, and i think it goes both ways right because like folks who are um gonna be really uh affected and emotional in a hurt way by hate comments can also conversely be like like way too much on a high for the comments that are like good comments and so that parasocial relationship can go both ways of like yeah. oh man you know somebody says like oh man i really love I, I love what you do i love you and if you're only chasing that and really not going for the negative ones it's it's almost like it is it becomes the same thing that I think that's yeah. somewhere like in like neutrality zone of like, again, knowing the source, you know, like George Carlin saying like, oh, that's awful is probably going to be make you go, oh, maybe I should revisit and think about this or mm -hmm. George Carlin saying, oh, that's really, really good could could, you know, make you go on a high. But I think that if you really, really are convinced with what you're doing somewhere in the neutral zone of like neither one affects you that much is probably the mm. sweet spot um because yeah. yeah i think hate hate comments and love comments can all yeah it can it can be on the same plane if you let it get to you too much yeah for sure i mean i have a question about this because like i think growing up in the states depending on the neighborhood you're in you're you know, sometimes you're around people that look like you and then sometimes you're not. Right. So you grew up in what? North Cal, right? Mm -hmm. So how was it growing up there? Like, were you, were you, did you feel like you fit in or did you feel like you were like a standout? I feel like there were some extremes. Like there mm. would be pockets where I'm like, Whoa, I don't belong here. And then and then in the very same vein, in the very same day, you know, like a mile away, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I like really belong here. Like, um, <laughs> like ballet, my ballet world was so varied. Um, and that meant, you know, like all all sorts of folks, all ages, you know, like I was in a professional um, dance company that had me, a three year old at, the, at some point, you know, like on tour. Mm -hmm all the way up to like people who are like in their 40s and 50s dancing because it was a professional wow. company and so like it was this f this full range of people and lots of different walks of life and lots of um international folks as well because they come here you know they, they come into the united states and get a visa and uh work with professional companies and so it was like yeah very very varied um, so my ballet world, I feel like was really, really, um, e everyone. And then at school, there would be moments where I felt like a belong. And then other moments where I'm like, whoa, like in, I remember in sixth grade history class, we went and through like a world war two unit 
and I was the only Japanese person in class. Um, mm. I think maybe we had like a couple of other Asian people in class, but me being the only Japanese person, I remember this kid turning around and, and saying, thanks for World War II. And I was like, I was like, me? <laughs> Me, I'm like, I'm responsible. And I remember going <laughs> home that day being like, oh my gosh, I'm responsible for the world war, you know? And it's like, <laughs> I don't know. It's like, I put the responsibility on my shoulders because this dumb kid turned around and was like, this is you in the history book that we're learning about. See on the chalkboard? That's you. <laughs> Like that affected me a lot, a lot, a lot. Yo, Yo that's a wow. Thanks for World War Two, jerk. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yo, and, and I wish that's I was wild. like I wasn't there. I'm the same age as you. I wish I could have said that, but I was like, right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Freaked out because I look at the history Yo. and I'm like yeah that looks like it could be my grandpa you're right <laughs> oh no you know and so as a kid I didn't know what to do but yeah hmm. there were there were definitely wild moments so during that time like what how how was like anime at that time where you were living it what wasn't was like a th it, anime anime wasn't talked about at all it wasn't it, it was it was a ghost but like i think i think for me i grew up on anime on vhs like oh, like wow. scrapped from japanese television and my my aunt would send them in like giant boxes and i would just oh, take wow. out the vhs and pop it in and i wouldn't know what was on it and i would just watch stuff and so Oh wow. Yeah. I I didn't grow up actually on a lot of American television. Like I don't think to this day I've ever seen a, a full episode of Sesame Street. Like Oh wow. Did not grow up on Sesame Street, but did grow up on like just a bunch of anime and Japanese TV and like NHK, but it was like yeah, so it was VHS tapes from from my relatives. And then there was this um, VHS rental place that was attached to a supermarket called Saruki Market in San Mateo, California. And they had a VHS okay. place and you could rent VHSs, but they were all ripped VHS tapes. Like somebody in Japan was ripping television, putting it on VHSs, sending it to this little like side hustle place at this market and then renting it out because <laughs> now no, that i'm thinking this... of it i'm like that wasn't legit <laughs> there's no way that that is such a 90s business though like that is that, like oh i'm bootlegging this because in vegas we had a lot of like stores like that in chinatown where you uh -huh. could go and just get like these super bootleg video games for like your playstation one of like japanese like or like um like dragon ball games that never released in the states or oh, some offshoot awesome. pokemon game or yeah oh my god we had so many like yeah, but continue. Now we I call it Pal World. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the offshoot Pokemon game. <laughs> um, so yeah, like I, 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 I grew up watching Dragon Ball, original Dragon Ball, but oh, it's one wow. of those things. Yeah, and and my brother is nine years older than I am. Um, and he was like a huge, like jump, jump fan. Like, I just remember mm. like so much manga, like in his room. Um, and yeah, we would just watch Dragon Ball, but you know, it's crazy. Like it's, it's one of those like kid memories where I'm like, I don't remember the story. And as an adult, I've <laughs> never gone back to rewatch Dragon Ball. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I just remember he was naked a lot and he had a tail and it was like yeah. fun. And there was, I, you know, like the theme song is still like so good in my head. Yeah. But I don't remember the story at all. Like <laughs> the over. <laughs> it's like you somebody know what's being crazy? Like... At, 
at that time in the States, you were probably the only person in your area that even seen Dragon Ball. Yes. Because it, I think they did a test. They did a test for Dragon Ball. Like they did like a short run of episodes and it didn't run. It didn't work. So they canceled it. And then years later, they brought Dragon Ball Z to the States and tested it again. And it started doing well. So they kept it on Toonami. And I never watched it on Toonami because I didn't have cable. Our oh, family God. didn't have cable. Our family didn't have cable, like, I think until I was in college. And so all throughout, like, uh, the, the whole, like, anime run on American television, I've never watched before. I've only watched anime in Japanese as a kid. <laughs> That's man, you like. I mean, it makes sense. You're Japanese, so like, it's it would make sense that you get like the source, like from the source. Yeah. That's so. So, what were the other shows then that you were getting from Japanese TV that maybe at that time we wouldn't even know? Uh, crayon Shinchan. <laughs> Have you heard of Crayon, crayon Shinchan? Sh- Shinchan? Shinchan? Okay, uh-uh. so this this follows a kid who's probably like like maybe in kindergarten, and this kid's always like pantsless too. Um, I don't know. It's like a Japanese <laughs> culture thing where like kids are allowed to be naked, um, and he's just a total brat. He's a total snot. Um, he always like undresses in his kindergarten class and like draws like an elephant face, like where his like private parts are. And so like he's a total brat. It's so yeah. Crayon Shinchan. Again, I would not be able to tell you any story arcs of Crayon <laughs> Shinchan. But the fact that he was um, just a rebellious little kid. And I think for me, like, I liked watching rebellion happen in media because I was so, like, not allowed to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, it, everything in my life was so strict that maybe I liked the, those types of shows. Because the other mm. one that I watched as a very, very young kid is um, Chibi Maruko-chan. And this mm. is a kid who resembled me as a kid. She was like really small mm. and she had little like jagged um, uh, bangs and short hair. And she has the soul of an, like a much older, older person because uh, mm. her like best friends basically are her grandma and grandpa. And so she kind of like is this little tiny kid who talks a little bit like an old person. Um, and she has the juxtaposition of being like very sweet and also very like lazy and just sort of kind of like uh grumpy and i don't know like 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 somebody at 60 years old within like a kid's body and so yeah maruko-chan i think defined a lot of my humor growing up because um I, I still see it. Peter Peter watched through all of Marukotan in Japanese, and he's like, "Oh, I see. This very <laughs> much like defined your humor." <laughs> yeah, it's it was fun to rewatch it as an adult for sure. <laughs> That's so interesting. Is there like so? Obviously, you got that when you were a kid, and did, mm-hmm. as you were getting older, did you watch anything else, or was it more so of like you were just getting more into American television? Uh, no, Sailor Moon was the next phase. That was probably Ooh. like fourth grade through sixth grade. I was so obsessed, and that was the same time that I think I was coming into my own and trying to figure out, like, quote unquote, like who am I, you know? And so right. Sailor Moon is like the perfect show to figure out your archetypes, whether you're oh, wow. like, you know, like the the sort of like ditzy but sweet, but like also like total leader, like Usagi is, or are you just kind of like the like the hard ass, like uh, Sailor Mars is, and like so. It was the same time that I was like figuring out, out like my 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 astrology and like I'm like well I'm a Scorpio so I must be this type of person and you know like as 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 you do when you're a kid you're like who am right. I and figuring it out and so Sailor Moon for me was like like one day I would be like yeah I'm just like Ray and you know like I'm like really like like badass and cool and then other days I'm like oh but I'm feeling kind of like you know, I don't know, like a little bit more like Sailor Mercury today or whatever. And so that was the next <laughs> phase. Um, 
And then after that, I was fully into Rudoni Kenshin. And I think that that... Mm. I think that anime paired with um, Dragon Ball GT was mm. that was my thirsty phase because I was like, oh, anime characters are hot. So it was like Trunks. <laughs> it was Trunks and Kenshin all the all the way for me. I was like, I was like, all right, cool. Now we're really watching it. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious i'm yeah. into it now i'm really I'm into, into it, it now. now for different reasons because i'm an adult now no this was like maybe like right. eighth grade <laughs> right right <laughs> i remember uh we made a trip to japan and oh my gosh i went through like a full like maybe three days just running around japan looking for a single CD of the theme song from Rudoni Kenshin, which is called mm. Sobakasu, which means freckles mm. in Japanese. Mm. But I was so obsessed with this show that I, I like, I, it was like a mission. I was like on a treasure hunt to find a single CD of this. And the CD was like, do you remember those miniature CDs? That was like this, yes. like a normal CDs like this. Yeah, it was like yeah. a miniature CD. The mini and I had to, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, I remember when I found it, I was just head over heels. And there's only two songs on there, right? It's like like the yeah. extended cut and then the anime cut, which is like 32 seconds long. And yeah. so I remember listening to it over and over and over again. Oh my gosh, I was so <laughs> obsessed. Good song. That That's interesting. Cause I actually just, st I had started watching uh, Rurouni Kenshin um, I actually stopped. I don't know why I stopped. I just stopped like cold turkey. Because uh, <laughs> like they, they, re, they, they remade it. So, oh, really? Yeah. So it's like an updated version of it. Um, so I started watching it and then I just stopped cold turkey. I don't know why I stopped. Maybe I, I wasn't that interested in it. Mm -hmm. But I just like stopped and I was like, oh, damn, I forgot. I was watching that. Like I, it That's was funny. It was strange. But I was liking it because it felt like that era of anime was very simple to follow. It wasn't like, oh, all these crazy storylines. It was kind of like villain of the week, next guy. You know what I'm saying? Like your main, like, so it was, I liked it, but I don't know if it was holding my attention enough for me to want to go back to keep watching it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think some, some shows, if you haven't seen them when they came out during that time, it's really hard, I think, to, attach yourself because storytelling evolves right yes. it's like um it's almost like when people uh i'll give you an example brie she's never seen star wars right anything from star wars that's uh, rare finding someone who hasn't watched star wars ever that's yeah a, that's awesome so i decided to this was my bad for sure it was like later at night she was kind of tired but i was like let's put on episode episode four right let's put on oh. a new hope <gasps> Oh, right for the first right. go. for the first go it was a bad time first and foremost but like to her it just seems like a really old movie right like it's it's like okay like really old graphics and you know the it, it's i think for her it was kind of like oh okay <laughs> like this, i did do a rewatch mm -hmm. of that recently and i was like there are some scenes where it holds on for too long and i'm like why didn't we cut a few frames out guys? <laughs> yeah i'm like george lucas rewatched this added a bunch of things why are we still holding what? on to this scene for this long yes, yes. I'm like i don't think we need to see this whole pan happen yeah, yeah it does it, feel it, slow so, yeah i it was yeah, and so I think in certain things like it's of the time, and it's like yeah, you might like it, but it's not going to have the same effect. I think um, yeah, later Nostalgia on. Nostalgia goggles are powerful, oh, super powerful. Yeah, yeah, super powerful. So you had <laughs> Roni Kenshin, Dragon Ball GT. Was there anything that was like? obscure that you were watching that you were like, Ooh, I like this character or that you resonated with outside of like the, the thirsty phase that you went through. I, okay. Well, I will say I was thirsty, but the fact is I really like Kenshin as a character because okay. he's like extremely strong. Very, mm. very, very, very strong. Right? Like 
OP hmm. compared to anyone else. And because he knows that, he, he like, puts a handicap on himself. He right. doesn't use the sword side. He uses the other side so that he's only he's he's Batmaning it, right? Like yeah. he's he's fully yeah. going Batman. I only strike in order to like incapacitate, probably give a lot of concussions, which right. Don't well, want to mess with that. Good. Anyway, yeah. um, <laughs> it's Batman being like, oh yeah, no, he'll wake up later. And it's like I don't think so, Batman. <laughs> I, don't think he, I don't think he's waking up from that but okay whatever lets you sleep at night um so yeah like i i love that character i love that he, you know the the show goes from you know deadly badass to like like kind of naive and really nice and all that stuff so i like that juxtaposition um mm. let's see what was i watching that was not as known I feel like it would. It, I would have to go through like a, a full watch or like a, a full sort of like list of of things in that era. I mean, it was also stuff that was known in that era, like like Ghost in the mm. Shell. I think I had a real profound mm. sort of um, impact on me because I don't know. I don't think that I was able to like quantify it in my head, but like the depth and the. Um, like adult conversations that were happening in Ghost mm. in the Shell left a mark where I was like, I, I was able to see the medium as as this is for adults, you know, and it's like mm. there there's a lot of concepts that I can't understand. Um, right. I, I I think I think having a ghost in the shell was only a concept that that became more like understandable after being hooked on devices and understanding what a computer is and that game right. went way down the line where i'm like oh yeah a deleted file i get it sometimes there's remnants of the deleted file and that's what they're talking yeah. about you know like it took a very very <laughs> long time to conceptualize that but i i think at an early age it gave me sort of like a runway of like hey when i'm ready to understand this there's stuff like this out here um mm. And then like Miyazaki, but Miyazaki is kind of like Disney. Like I, 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 I yeah. absolutely grew up on Miyazaki um, films, like the Japanese ones, um, and those were also really confusing. I, th I think I watched those as an adult, and I'm still like, what is this about? Like it was really <laughs> a moving, sweeping story. <laughs> it's you know about the world um but i think a lot of the ones that i watched as a kid like i still to this day do not understand um tonari no totoro or uh, my neighbor totoro i don't know what mm. that story is about i think it's about baby growing up but i just liked it because the grandmother in that um in that movie looks just like my grandmother my my dad's oh, wow. mom and she like She's worked on a farm all her life. She is turning 105 this year. Wow. Um, yeah. And she just. Yo, ooh. that's. Yeah. That's Isn't crazy. That <laughs> She's oh like straight my up God. like a Miyazaki grandma. Like, ugh. Quintessential. And what does she do? Does she still do stuff? Like, she's still out and about? Like, no, no. She's got Alzheimer's now, and so she's just living oh, no. her best life. Yeah. yeah. She, doesn't, she, doesn't, she doesn't remember anything, but I think she's... Every time we have gone to see her, I saw her for her 100th birthday, and she was just loving her birthday party. Um, the mayor <laughs> came and, and gave her, gave her a certificate. Came. Yeah, the mayor came, and she was very, wow. very excited. We all got in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> There's a picture of me in the Japanese newspaper with my 100 year old grandma. It's so cute. Um, but yeah, I, I think I didn't really understand Miyazaki films when I was a kid. I just mm. it was just like, I think it was, but but I don't know. Maybe that was perfectly okay that there wasn't this sort of like beautifully like tied up ending it was kind of open-ended where it was like oh that was a slice of that person's life and mm. and then it probably keeps going i just was mm. able to kind of see like a pinhole size like moment and then right. and then we kind of like 
go about our day. There doesn't have to be like a, and they lived happily ever after ending. Right. I mean, so, okay. So what about, was there any, like, cause for those that don't know, like you've transitioned into, into actress, producer, like, and, and not just actress, like action and like, you're not just doing drama and comedy. Like you're doing action stuff, uh, martial arts, you're training, like, Walk me through this, because like, I I think a lot of people that are in one particular thing for for a long time get like, I don't want to say maybe afraid of trying something new, but you've already transitioned once before from dance to creator, and then now you're in this whole new realm and and going like this, and it's like, walk me through like how does that feel going from creator to actress producer. How does that how does that feel? It feels scary sometimes. It mm. definitely feels scary sometimes. And and other times it feels so like like I don't know. The the only way that I can think of it is is like going super sad and be like, ah. you know, like it just <laughs> it feels awesome at times and then other times it feels like a free fall. And and I think that the moments that feel awesome it's because I compare it to the very linear path that I was on. And now I'm on this mm. path where it is fully open and I believe it mm. to be fully open. Like, like I can, I know that I am allowed to walk a path where it's like, yeah, this is what I'm doing right now. And then once this chapter closes, there's going to be another chapter and I fully mm. believe it. But before it was like a, um, I, I am sticking to one book and that one book has one chapter in it. Um, mm. and so those are the moments that feel awesome. I think the, the, the moments where it feels like it's a free fall is when I stop believing in myself because there is no shortage of people believing in me. Um, mm. you know, I've, I've had incredible support systems and friends like you, Adonis, who keep me on that track. Um, and it, the hard part is I have come to realize that no matter how much support you have around you and people rooting for you, if you don't believe in yourself, there's no amount of support that can that can really get you out of things. And that's been a, mm. a hard sort of thing where I go, oh, my gosh, like way to take for granted the, the people going, boo, go my around you and me being like, mm. ah. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, it feels like I'm taking it for granted. And yet, if I don't believe and and can and take that energy and go, yeah, all right, let's freaking go. You know, like, if I don't mm. have that in me, then then I'm I, it's, it's a disservice to myself and the people around me. And so, like, crawling out of that hole sometimes is really, really, really difficult. Um, and I mm. know you and I have had, like, talks in the past where where one of us was, like, in a hole and the other one has to just, like, drag, yeah. drag the other person <laughs> yes. out. Yes, um, yes, And it's like, it's like, yeah, like, I think I know what needs to happen, but if I don't believe that there's a solution, then I'll stay there, even though people around me are like, let's go. I'm like, yeah, you, I, I would believe that you can do it. I don't believe I can right now. And so <laughs> I think um, it, it's it's a it's a back and forth of feeling those things. Um, mm. But I don't know, you know, like I, 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 I think that I have been able to have this type of life because of the motivations that I've had from the media that I was consumed mm. with. And that's a lot mm. of video game characters and a lot of anime characters because that's where mm. I saw myself, you know, other than Power mm. Rangers, like I didn't see myself in a lot of the characters that I saw on television. Mm. Um, right. And so video game characters and anime, I think even if they didn't look like me, the language was, you know, in, in my language for anime. For video games, I could embody anyone and it's still me, whether I'm an ogre right. or Lara Croft or, um, you know, like an alien. I'm like, no matter what, that's me. It might not right. look like me, but it is me. And so mm. I think I was able to kind of like, 
get into the mindset of like, okay, I, I want to be able to live my life like this. And it wasn't until I hit 25 that I was like, all right, we're rebelling. We're going to go jump out of airplanes. We're going to go summit Kilimanjaro. We're going to go like take, take chances. And that's where YouTube fell on my lap. And I, and I was like, all right, I'll take a chance. I'll take a stab at something. And then it just turned mm. into this whole lifestyle, which is no roadmap. It's scary, <laughs> but it's also exhilarating. <laughs> so like, I mean, you, you touched on some really cool stuff. And I think the, one of the things that I think you touched on is like how, when you have all these people that are believing in you, but then you don't believe in yourself, but then you have to find a way to get out of it. Like get out of that. Like when, when you are in that mode, like what's like the thing you go to, like, what do you go to to try to like, like persevere or kind of push out of that? Like, you know, it's, it's an interesting question because I feel like I'm, I, I am finding that in like the past like few weeks like i've been in a weird funk mm. since the pandemic and during mm. the pandemic like i was like how dare i dot 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 right how dare i make content when when this is all happening in the world how how dare i like i don't know like put stuff out that that is making me happy while all of this is going on and so i went through mm. like a real slump um mm. And, and I think the thing that has helped me come out of it was a, you know, allowing myself to, to just be in my head, mm -hmm. a, like being nicer to myself and, and the whole like thing about self love and self acceptance and all that stuff. Like, I think I shoved it off for a very long time because I'm like, I'm like, I don't know people around me accept me so that's that's good and and for me to accept myself i think it took a lot longer um mm. and it was work that i didn't want to put in like i didn't want to put in the time to do it because i it just felt mm. like a slog and it just felt like like i have other stuff to do and other things to cover it up and so i don't want to work on me because it's good enough but i think during mm. the pandemic where everything kind of slowed down enough and there was enough rhetoric out there being like no you should like really like work on yourself like oh like be nice to yourself allow allow yourself to dot 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 you know and so i think i just slowed down enough to allow myself to do it and for mm. a long time i think it took me in the in the direction of like like self-love equals just letting yourself stay in that mode for a long time. And like every day I'm like, yeah, you know, if I was a friend, I would just let myself just sit on the couch all day and just be miserable. Cause that's, that's, I would tell my friend like, yeah, just, just, just do you. Just and so I think, yeah. yeah. And so I think like it was a, it was a push and pull for me because it was a lot of that. And then I would feel resentful, but then some days I would feel better I think I gave myself that time and then I, I pulled my, my myself off the freaking couch, you know, I was like, come on, you had your time. Let's freaking go get <laughs> yeah. out there. Stage is there. Go work, you know? And so like, I think yeah. for me, that's what I needed. I needed a part of my friend, a part of myself to be that friend, to be like, no, 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 you should rest. You should allow yourself to rest and you should fully let, let yourself do it. And then the other part of me would be like, mm. all right, cool. You got your rest. Let's freaking go. Let's right. go. Let's go. <laughs> and so I don't know. I, I wish I had a go to thing where it was like, yep, that is the thing. But I think it is media. I think there are some things that really inspire mm. me as far as like media goes. And it's like a lot of it is the way something was made. Um, mm. Kind of like. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I wish I had the one thing, though, that would always pull me out. But it changes for sure. Yeah. I I'm in that same boat. Like I think the media thing for me, sometimes I get motivated by something I see and I'm like, Ooh, like it just kind of gets me going. Um, I know there's, there's one anime that I watch, uh, every week it's called Ace of diamond. Hmm. Uh, it's a baseball anime actually. Awesome. <laughs> and Ace of diamond. Uh, wait, Ace of diamond. Yeah. I thought yeah. it was going to be like a magic anime show. <laughs> <laughs> so the pictures are Sounds called like aces. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, so like the Wait, main pitcher is that normal? for your team. I don't team. know baseball. Is that a normal baseball I don't term? Know, I don't know baseball that much either, but I'm assuming the ace is like so from what I've from what I've learned from this anime is <laughs> the 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 main pitcher for your team is called the ace. Okay. So it's essentially this kid has a ton of potential, but he wants to be the ace of this team. Uh, and it's his kind of journey to become this ace on this team. And for whatever reason, sports animes to me, I resonate so much because there's so many like real practical elements to these shows, um, whether it be Hayekyu, Hajime no Ippo, um, any of these shows that are sports animes, in real life, there is only a winner. There is no like everybody gets a happy ending. There is, that mm. doesn't happen in sports, right? It's like somebody has to lose. Somebody is not the starter. You're the starter, or or you're trying to, and you just never get to become the starter or the star player. Or it's so there's a a real a real life application I think for these types of shows to me. Whether you're an athlete, a dancer. Um, an actor, whatever, like there's like this real tangible, relatable thing where you're like, damn, like, yeah, sometimes you just you you want it so bad. And the person you're playing also wants it so bad. They want they want to win, too. But there can only be a winner. And it's yeah. like, how do you how do you deal with when you want it so bad and you just lose or you finally get there or, you know, so there's something about the show, though, that. It's like it's such a feel good show, even though there's this roller coaster of real life circumstances uh, and you're seeing this character go through the highs and lows. And for whatever reason, every week, regardless of how I'm feeling, it's like a, it always feels like it just raises my my drive for the day. And I'm just like, oh, like, all right, like I just get really excited about doing stuff Um that's so cool. For me, I, did, I wouldn't it's expect so that weird. from a sports anime. I've never watched a sports anime before. So the first sports anime I watched was an anime called Hayekyu. And it's a volleyball anime. And people were like, you have to watch Hayekyu. And I'm like, for real? Like, no, like, I don't. No, I don't know. And so I was like, for real? So one of my one of my dancer friends, Maho Udo, um, he dances for Chris Brown at the moment. He was telling me, he was like, yeah, sports animes are big, like big in the, in Japan. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah. Like he was talking about these soccer animes and baseball animes. And I was like, what? So I told him about Hayekyu. He's like, you should watch it. Cause he's read the manga. He reads more manga than he watches anime, but he was telling me to watch it. And I was like, all right, maybe I'll give it a shot. And Hayekyu's in my top five. Like, uh, wow. of, I, absolutely love this show and i was like oh my god like i think and but it was because of that real it felt real it felt grounded so yeah, you, I you never like even I, you, you've never watched a sports anime before never because i think i just kind of like roadblock it for myself where i'm like well i'm not a sports person and i don't like do that sport nor will i ever yeah. so what you know what am i gonna get out of it but i think you're right um i've never thought of it with the analogy of like winners and losers in the sense of like that is real life like mm. we are you know like our our um disappointments in life and stuff like that it is a lot more realistic i think in a realistic sort of viewpoint but from mm. like a from like a sports anime sort of uh viewpoint because it's realistic in real life but i don't know i think that i have gotten those similar um, similar things from like more of like the fantastical ones too. And maybe that's why people love anime so much because it's like yeah. the storytelling is no matter what fantastical world you're in, the problems still seem to stem from human places where it's just like yeah. you, you have to want something, right? You either want love or you want, you know, revenge and hate or you, you know, it's like the, the needs yeah. are still human no matter what the world is. Um, yeah. So I think, I think maybe that's why people like it. Who knows? <laughs> so, cause I, I mean, the, the, the storytelling aspect, right? Obviously, you're in in film and you've seen TV, movies, you've been in both. And then you've obviously consumed a ton of anime. You've played a ton of games. 
what is what do you feel in your opinion are, are like your favorite types of storytelling like what medium do you feel is like your favorite because i feel like they all have their own like tropes uh and ways of doing things what's your preferred method of digesting a story oh gosh that's a really good question i think it varies as far as mm. um like how i'm feeling about it i think with video games i put myself center front and center you know mm. like i i see myself in whatever character that i'm playing most of the time i i play like rpg or rp like rpgs um survival crafting type games and or mm. story driven games and so i think i put myself in the shoes of that character so i think if i am feeling like i want to put myself front and center it's video games if i mm. want to um kind of watch somebody else's life unfold I, I think that's for me that's anime that's films that's tv i i think that's mm. i'm more of an observer in that sense um i think with anime what i love is that you you can be completely sold on extreme emotions um mm. And I think the way we feel extreme emotions resonate with us. Like we, you know, when, when we're on, you know, um, highs and lows or, you know, like seething hate or, you know, like real, mm. like, be like, like amorous love, whatever the, 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 the edges are, I think in anime, you see it you know whether it's rage and and like the most like disgusting violence versus you know like the sweetness and and the cutesiness right. and and all the like the wonderful feelings that we have in our in ourselves too <laughs> like you see those extremes and you're sold on it there is no question of like i don't believe that character you know like i don't <laughs> believe that that like that giant character can also be like pink and fancy and cutesy it's like right. whatever it is you're like i mm. buy that <laughs> that's so, so interesting yeah yeah oh gosh i'm thinking of one character and i can't remember uh what it ah oh, never mind but but yeah it's like what whatever character it is i think you can be sold on it and i think maybe that's why anime resonates in a in a in a way where it hits people like to the core because mm. uh, there are times where you know it, extreme sort of like feelings of like happiness or rage or like like excitement that i feel like i'm going super saiyan right and like the the best way to to um express it would be to just like scream into the sky and just have like mm. fire and energy like <laughs> raging about you like and it's like when you watch that I think that you're not quantifying it as like, what's that stuff around that guy? You know, it's like, what's, <laughs> you know, you're just like, yeah, when it's pure emotion, that mm. is the artistic expression of what that mm. feels like when you have this like primal yell coming out of you. And so like, yeah, I think that's the thing that I love about it. It's an artistic expression of our biggest emotions. Um, yeah, and everything else in between, you know? I, I also love the sort of, like, coziness of, of, like, everyday life and the slice of life and all that stuff, too. Mm. Yeah, the I think when, like, even when we do stuff with, like, Ismahawk and the collaboration we've been able to do in, like, um, the, I think, obviously, Danny and Jer have, like, that, artistic eye of wanting to bring some of these action things from anime to life uh you know and how they visualize some things um in the martial arts stuff that you do and like your training and stuff like that like does it does it feel at times that you draw from that type of stuff like what's like a motivation in that like Cause I'm not a martial artist. So like me, I'm like, I would like in my head, I'm like, I would hella be trying to do like Naruto shit. Like, but I'm not a martial yeah. artist. So like. It is absolutely drawing from that. And 
it was funny. I was uh, I do Krav Maga, and I was in class the other day, and afterwards, um, the guy was like, "I can tell you've trained before," and I'm like, "Nah, dude. I just watch a lot of anime, and I and I play a lot of video <laughs> games. I'm like, I can look." Like I know what I'm doing because of <laughs> because of the visualization, and I swear right. to you, it, it it some of it has to do with the fact that I am a like I learn from doing things. Is it called kinetically when you do things like from yeah. like physically? Yeah, I'm a kinetic yeah. learner. If I watch you do something, I see it as choreography and I can like implement it, right? And so mm -hmm. when I'm doing anything, whether it's fight choreography for cin for cinematic martial arts or if I am in a like real IRL fighting um like tactical fighting course like for like Krav Maga, which is more practical, um mm. I see it as choreography and and I see right. it as like, okay, it's this, 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 and then this. It, I implement it in my body and then the way that I visualize and see it, I do see it as like, what do anime characters look like? What do video game mm. characters look like? That I, that I do think that like, you know, whether it's like a stance or, you know, like where I'm coming from, like it's all informed by video mm. games and anime. Like I can sell something to make it look more cool because I've watched it. <laughs> so let that be some sort of lesson for people. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I mean, that that's so funny. Cause like, it, it's kind of weird. Cause like my best friend Toshi, he, he got into martial arts because he wanted to be a Power Ranger when he was a kid. Like he yes. loved the Green Ranger. So he got into Taekwondo because he, he saw Power Rangers. He was like, yo, I want to do this. And it's, it's one of those things where in my head seeing like when like we were doing like Azuki and like seeing like all that go together I'm like oh my god like that's all I was thinking about was like man if I I would I would definitely do this but I'm not a martial artist but like seeing you guys do it and I'm like they kind of like where where does that come from like it's like I don't know because it, it felt like that when I was watching it but I don't know people's in, I don't know people's uh, inspirations for movement. You Dude, know what I mean? Like you, I don't know where they're the drawing this from. This is the undercell of the century. I cannot believe you're like I'm not. I'm not a martial artist. I, you would be able to pull it off so easily, Adonis. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you are so in your body. Like you know, you know how your body moves. You would pick it up so quickly. Um, and and I think it's it's a mixture, right? Like you come from having so much experience as a performer as a dancer that you you'd be able to to churn it into what this is and i think that's the full sort of like intention of like everything that i do is like there is mm. no experience in your life that is for granted i'm able to do choreography mm. in cinematic martial arts or whatever it is because of ballet like if i mm. didn't have that training it would not be the same and so like all experiences, however varied, whatever it is, all the different jobs that you've had, you mm -hmm. are, if you are willing to learn from those things, you will be able to extract little things and implement it into um, whatever you do. And for me, it's like, I don't know, when I'm pulling for, for from, from things and like acting and stuff like that, I'm not you know like if if i'm if i'm working at uh my, my character is working at a laundromat i'm not pulling from well you know what maybe i'll go work at a laundromat for six months and figure it out you know i'm pulling mm. from the 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 days that i worked at you know at, at a climbing gym that were mundane and how i stood around and mm. you know like how my body was when I was standing around working in that environment. And that's what I'm pulling from, you know, it's like mm. all your experiences are, are going to be fuel and tools in your belt. If you know how to look for them. Um, mm. And so, yeah, yeah. I, I hope that that folks who, you know, aspire to do other things in their lives don't see their present like place they are in their life as a blockage or you know like a waste of time or or something mm. that's pulling them up because you're going to be able to take that and 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 put it into the next thing no matter what yeah. it is 
No, that's awesome. I think that's, yeah, that's super powerful. Because I think sometimes we look at it, we, we talk about all the time in our meetings of like the dots connect backwards. But like, are you intentionally looking at that either of like, what are the skills or the things that I've learned or experiences that can help me in whatever else I'm trying to do? Because uh, I, I struggle with that where it's like, okay, baby's on the way. So I'm like, okay, uh, I need to start adding more things to the to the financial uh portfolio because i have a human i now have to be taking care of right so it's like all right what moves do i need to make well what can i do all right well all right like oh i've been out of the workforce for eight years so what does that look like do i go work for someone do i freelance for something and do video stuff like so it's like it's like this weird game you're playing of what can I do? Like, like in, I, that's actually super, even for myself hearing you say that is, is a real cool way of looking at stuff. Um, moving forward is almost like looking back and like Rolodexing your experiences and saying, okay, what's the, what are all these, you know, Pokemon that I've collected all of? Like, how can I, how can I use yes. this? Absolutely. Because the, the industry continues to change and, mm. Even now, you know, there are platforms out there that are looking to content creators who are to, to be like, I, how do we fix the UI? Like, how do we make mm. this better for creators? And, you know, there's going to be new creators all along, but right. less and less creators who are like, yeah, I've been doing this for 10 years. I've been doing this for 15 years. I've been doing this for 25 right. years. And I've got a yeah. lot of experience and knowledge. Um, you know, like there's going to be so, so much runway. It just might not be clear right now. But like you said, Listen. when you're able to look back on it, you're like, oh, that connected to that, connected to that. I think even the conversations mm. that we're having now of like, how do you stay in this game for this long and still stay mm. sane, right? When there is no yeah. roadmap for us, there is no yeah. like, well, you know, you go into the uh, hypothetical content creator university and then you, you get your content creator job and then you go up the, <laughs> the content creator ladder until you're a CEO of the company. There's none of that. There is no structure right. to the game right. that we're in. So I think there will be constant conversations of like, like you've been doing this for 10 years, how? And I think that there will be more and more conversations of like, how do you, how do you keep doing this? Because mm. the biggest question is like, are we going to be doing this when we're 80? You know, it's like, will, will you, ha will we have, you know, podcasts like this, where it's like, somebody's going to be like, I've been listening to this podcast for 60 years. Thank you so much. You know, it's like 60 like, years. Yeah. yeah. And like it, 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 it sounds bananas until, until it's totally not. I think it's completely mm. viable, you know, like Mark mm. Maron's had his podcast for, I think, nearly 10 years now. And it's like mm. um, he started it when when people didn't believe in podcasts at all. And there's no there's no end to it. So it's like, right. you know, people being like, oh, yeah, I've been watching you for a decade is totally normalized now. I've been doing this right. for 14 years now, you know, and it's yeah. like I, I, I think that more and more the conversations are going to be around how do we continue doing this? How do we keep making art right. and enjoying it? Yeah. That's so powerful. Ugh, that's so powerful. So before we go, before we go, I, I have to ask you this, uh, I guess it's kind of like a two part question um, is top five. We need, we need a, we need a Mari top five of anime. Uh, and it can be movies or shows, whatever you want to put in there. And then what character do you feel that from what you've seen, do you resonate the most with like that? You're like, oh, this is like this feels like either me or maybe something you, you aspire to be or anything like that. Oh, I love this. I love that question. Uh, also, both very, very difficult questions. Um, yeah. Some of these answers for top five are going to be like some nostalgia goggles because I have not watched them mm. since I have become an adult. Um, 
Okay. N in no particular order. I okay. think I have to put in. Oh my God. This is, this is hard, dude. This it is, is very hard. Um, I haven't watched this in a long time, but for whatever reason, it sticks in my mind of loving it. Um, I think it's The Wind Rises. It's a Miyazaki, mm. and um, it's about the war and how uh, um, an airplane, uh, like creator designer, um, designs for you know all the all the lovely reasons of being able to fly and all this stuff, and then his designs get perverted by by becoming war planes um, for the war, and so Ugh. it's all about how like art can you know turn into this evil, mm. it can manifest into this evil thing oh, wow. um, in in kind of like the wrong sort of like environments, and this guy coming in and out of like what have I created and and the thing right. that he loved. Um, so I think it's I think it's a wind rises. Um, oh, I'm going to put Chibi Maruko-chan Mar in there because um, okay. it's just, I think it's just me. Uh, I think, I think I am going to put it in Attack on Titan, even though the last Oof. seasons were not, um, were not up to, I don't know. I just didn't love the last seasons, but I think when it first hit, okay. I was just like, enamored by mm. how violent it was um was it the animation in the last seasons that you weren't feeling i definitely wasn't feeling the animations i also feel like they dropped like hundreds of years of lore all of a sudden and it's like we couldn't mm. like like i feel like i'm in a history lesson and i'm lost how many hundreds of years are we going back and like i'm like what yeah, what are they... we talking about here that last season, how they did it was not, they shouldn't have done it in these little movie segments. Like, it's just, it's just, it wasn't done, I think, the way it should have been handled. But yeah, I felt opinion. like I needed like a history map. And I was like, what, who, yeah. But the yeah. first seasons rocked my, my world, you know, like I would yeah. watch one and I would just be like, oh my God, I don't know if I'm okay. Uh, what's <laughs> going on? Um, yeah, I, lo I loved being rocked like that. Um, okay. Gosh. Uh, uh, this is so difficult. I think I want to put in... I think I'm going to put in Ghost in the Shell. I, I don't. Okay. I haven't watched all of the Ghost in the Shells. There's a there's a million different stories, but I'm just going to stick to the <laughs> first original one. Okay. Um, okay. And last one. Uh, this is kind of a a, a joke answer because I I don't want to pick one. I'm going to say, um, Way of the House Husband. Oh, what's Have you that? Seen that? It's, no. um, I think it's, that's what it's called in English. Um, it's, it's about a retired Yakuza who, um, is living with his like girlfriend and mm -hmm. he's in everyday situations. Like he's trying to get like the, um, community, like the, the, the HOA payment from people. But the way he does it is like really scary because he's like ex Yakuza and like Yakuza do, do like, uh, shakedowns for, you know, right. uh, for businesses and stuff. And so it starts off like that, but really he's just asking for like $5 for the HOA. And so it's like this juxtaposition <laughs> of like a scary Yakuza guy, but he's actually a very like, like domesticated, like house husband now. That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Little slice, slice of life. After this podcast is over, I'm gonna be like, ah, why didn't I put this in? Ah, why didn't I put this in? I don't know. There's a there's a lot. There's, there's a lot. so many. I, I really appreciate One Punch Man um, for the humor because I didn't know that there could be Japanese humor that was so kind of like American humor in the sense that it was mm. so sarcastic. That when I first right. watched that, I was like, whoa, this is cool. <laughs> They're just making fun of the thing. Anyway. Um, and the character that resonates, um, I feel like I feel like Rukia from Bleach a lot of the times. Mm. Like like somebody who is put into really like incredible positions and sometimes not feeling like you like you are um worthy i think if i remember mm. correctly because oh my god I, I i went through a bleach um uh 
binge of like you know 400 episodes i'll never watch anything <laughs> with 400 episodes ever again i was a young woman then it's a young person's <laughs> game um so i don't quite remember a lot of it because it just feels like a you know like a very long dream um but i feel like rukia not born into like the most um like regal family but adopted into a very regal family and having to have to kind of like prove her worth all along and, and i think it's my own imposter syndrome um that i feel like when i'm when i'm amongst giants i'm like oh my gosh i don't know if i belong here um but mm. she, but with rukia i think she often proves that that her sort of like hard work and metal and like work ethic get her to to the point where like she is able to defeat giants and she is able to prove mm. herself and things like that so yeah that's mm. my first instinct that's awesome that's fucking sick you're the you're the first bleach reference that's great i love oh, really? bleach so bleach, yeah i love bleach so yeah that's so sick i'm just um, ready for my, my bunk guy <sighs> <laughs> ready whenever <laughs> it'll hit <laughs> Ready for my superpowers. <laughs> Mari, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you. I appreciate all the talks we get to have, uh, obviously Likewise. on and off the pod, but uh, it's it's uh, an extremely valuable friendship that I, I cherish deeply. Uh, so I greatly appreciate it. And hopefully people can gain from your experience and your stories. And, you know, uh, yeah. Do you want to maybe drop anything that's coming that people might want to check in, tune into? Uh, anything that's coming is on um, my socials at Atomic Mari across the board. Um, I also have a gaming uh, channel as well where myself and three other people from the original Smosh Games crew, we still play video games because we can't seem to um, get away from each other's lives. And so <laughs> if you want to see dumb video game footage, that's that. And um, yeah. Uh, any, any other things will be on Atomic Mari. Sweet. Thank you. Thank you.